guys. Welcome to today's episode. And I'm so excited. We have Peter Martoni and he's from Boston. And so you know how in people in Boston, they're like, pack the car, wicked. So our topic today is how to get wicked good sleep. So Peter, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Chantal. I am so excited about sleep. I'm probably the most awake sleep expert in the country. I love sleep. I sleep so much. I have so much energy. So, so you're going to have to calm me down a little oh bit. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. And, you know, I do have an aura ring and I'll show you kind of some of my numbers, but I feel like I will, I'll ask you in just a minute, but, um, yeah, let's let's just talk about some of the I've got specific questions to ask you, but I want to talk about some of like the basics, right? So it's like if you want to get great sleep, let's talk about like your five top tips starting with the best to kind of the not as most important. That's great. So I get asked that question quite a bit, but I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of break it down into categories. People either have an issue with one of three areas. They okay. have an issue getting to sleep, staying asleep, or waking up energetic or well-rested. Mm. So the, the biggest thing with, with all of it, right, to encompass the entire, entire body, the best thing that you can do is that your body likes regularity. It likes to do the same thing over and over and over again. And as adults, we've kind of got away from this bedtime because when you think about bedtime, you think about, you know, I don't need to do that. I can stay up and watch, you know, my, my shows at night because I got no downtime. I have no time to unwind. But it, one of the most critical things that I teach my patients is go to bed, and wake up at the same time every single night. That's probably my biggest um, sleep tip. And you're like, oh, that's not a sleep tip. But it is because nobody does it. Everybody varies their schedule. Not me. And, and that, that's good. I love that. And then the second tip on top of that is that every hour of sleep before midnight is worth two hours of sleep after midnight. So now we're talking, oh, yeah, yeah, I go to bed at, at midnight every night, one o'clock, I'm good, but I sleep till nine. That's not the same nine hours of sleep or eight hours of sleep as going to bed at 10 o'clock or going to bed at nine o'clock and waking up at six o'clock. So it's so important to get to bed early, especially in the wintertime. So, wow, I go to bed pretty much every night, I sleep from nine to five. Like 9 p.m. That is, to 5 a.m. pretty much every single day. Sometimes it's 8.30 to 4.30. Sometimes it's 9 to 5.30. Sometimes it's 9.30 to 5.30. And, and the great thing about that, Chantel, is when you look at that little sign behind your head that says waste away, one of the things that I, I, that I teach, teach people as a nutritionist, if you want to lose weight, you need to make sure you speed up your metabolism, right? And one way to speed up your metabolism, metabolism is to get more sleep. When you get less sleep, studies show that your metabolism actually slows down. So that is so good that you're going to bed and you're waking up at the same time because your metabolism will follow. So let me back up for just a second because I really liked what you said. You said that people have trouble with three things, either staying asleep getting good sleep. And there was one more. What was the third one? Waking up well rested or energized. Okay. So a lot of times yeah. people will go to bed, they'll get eight hours of sleep, but they wake up and they're still tired. Um, and that means that you, and we, we will get into that. You're just not going through the proper sleep cycles that you're supposed to go through. So right. sleep tip number one was to go to sleep and wake up at the same time. Sleep tip number two was to make sure that you go to bed before midnight. And then sleep tip number three, really trying to get out of your own head is to think of, you can't remember yourself to sleep. No, sorry. You can't think yourself to sleep. You have to remember yourself to sleep. So just uh, recently, I, recently I came up with this thing where it's called the, um, the sleep memory. So you create a day where you go for a walk, you smell the roses, 
you you walk around the pond, you think about the birds in the sky, you do you you just become aware of your environment in a nice peaceful setting. Then you go to bed. Then the next night because you always have to sleep, you have to remember what happened like a day or two ago. You can't remember what happened that day from what I find. So if you then go to sleep and you remember everything about that walk where you're diving in, you're remembering the smells, you're remembering the birds, you're remembering the, the, how the water flowed and, and you're looking at how the sun glistened on the, on, the, on the water, whatever it is, you'll fall asleep. If you're remembering your to-do list of what you have to do tomorrow, you'll never fall asleep. See, because your sleep centers are in the back of your brain, your think centers are in the front of your brain. And the trick to fall asleep is to get the blood to go back here where your memories are, because this is where your memories are. So you want to remember yourself to sleep. You can't think yourself to sleep. So I will tell you for me personally, you know, my total sleep, I always, on my aura ring, I always get a great score because it's usually around eight hours. The efficiency is always a good score, but there's always two areas that I I don't get great scores all the time. Number one is where it says restfulness. It always for mine says pay attention. My REM sleep, some days it gives me a good score and sometimes it doesn't. But out of my scores, the the restfulness almost always says on there, pay attention. So what could that be caused from? Why am I now? I will say one thing. My husband does snore sometimes. So he wakes me up a little bit with that. Uh, but what, what would be another reason where my thing is saying I'm not restful? So your sleep centers in your pain centers are right next door to each other. So what ends up happening is when your body senses pain or senses discomfort, you'll move. And if your arms are moving, if you're a side sleeper and you fall asleep on your side, which more than the mo- more than likely the restlessness is coming from the sl- side sleeping position, you can only lie on your arm for so long of a period of time mm. before you have to turn to go to this arm, and mm. then you'll turn to go to this arm. So you toss and turn all night. It's because you're starting the night off in the wrong position. You're, you're not starting with the end in mind. So what, what my suggestion is you need to start which in a position, this is, this is, let's say, number three or number four, start in a neutral sleeping position. And this is the position where your weight is distributed over the greatest surface area. So if you look at me this way, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm kind of thin, you know, I'm buff though. You know what I mean? Not thin. I, just, I don't like to say that, but I'm buff, but you see how, see how short the surface area here is here, but now look at me, my surface area is greater. So I teach people to sleep with a soft down type pillow under their neck, right? So you take a pillow, you put it under their neck. And then don't support your head because that, that'll that happen if you have the pillow under your head. So you get a nice soft down pillow, put it under your neck, and then lie down. I, I, I know it sounds so uncomfortable, like you're in a coffin with your arms down by your side because what happens is that's a neutral position. And then what will happen is every once in a while, once you get used to it, your arms might move, but you won't have a restless night's sleep. At the beginning, that is very difficult to do to sleep in one position. Cause I wake, I, I'll go to sleep in one position and I'll wake up exactly in that position. You could put a glass of coffee, a cup of coffee on me or, or whatever it is. And I don't toss and turn at all ever. And that is because my body is in a neutral position. And that is one way to really help improve back and neck pain, especially like beyond the bed, like during the day, because you're sleeping in alignment. When you sleep like this, you'll toss and turn all night long. That's why that is. Mm, that is a great point. Well, you know, I'm passionate about intermittent fasting. And so I do want you to talk a little bit about, you know, how people sleep. And I want to give you this uh, first question. And it looks like it's from Peter Schwepper part. I don't know how to spell the last name or say the last name. I'm sorry, Peter, if I mess this up. 
he says, I do intermittent fasting. So I'm trying to maximize what time I eat. I usually eat at six o'clock and then go to sleep around 1030. But if I eat later and if I drink later, I always sleep terrible, way worse than if I stop eating at six. Even if I stop eating at eight o'clock, it seems like I sleep terrible. Is this just all in my head or does this have any relevance to how well I'm sleeping at night? And what is your suggestion of what is the last time? I'm wondering if I should actually start sleeping around or start eating at five o'clock instead. And that gives me more time to be able to digest my food. Is this all in my head? Question mark, question mark, question mark. So tell, uh, what is a byproduct of metabolism? Do you, do, so, well, I'll answer that, that question. The byproduct of metabolism is heat. So when you eat food, the digestion, digestive process causes heat. One of the issues with sleep and getting a good night's sleep is, is something that's called deep sleep. And you want your body to get into a deep, restful sleep. It usually happens within the first third of your sleep. So, so it, let's say you sleep for nine hours. In the first three hours, you really get most of your deep sleep. Um, th that's why you want to get in bed before midnight, by the way. You want your deep sleep to be before your energy spike, which is at midnight. So the what the way that your body gets into deep sleep is it needs to drop your core temperature by two degrees so if you have food in your digestive tract digesting digesting a lot of food while you're going to bed that's going to create heat and then your body isn't going to be able to drop down into deep sleep so you're not getting good deep sleep when you eat or when you drink meaning drinking alcohol because then your body detoxes from the uh, from the alcoholic beverages at there's actually other variables when it's alcohol but if it's just food it's because you're creating heat within your system and then that um, and then that heat um, it keeps you up it, does, it interferes with your with your sleep cycles so one way to offset that or, or what you can do I always and I'm a big intermittent faster I don't eat breakfast. And, um, and then I typically don't eat until noon. My noontime meal is typically my largest meal of the day. So for noon, I'll have a big salad is usually what I'll do. And then during dinner, I usually eat my dinner right around 630. And it's just a small portion of food. Now, the important thing is, is that you do want to have some carbohydrates in your system to be able to sleep through the night and to get a restful night's sleep. So if I feel that I didn't eat enough or I ate too little of a uh, or I ate uh, too early, what I'll end up doing is I'll get a little slice of gluten free toast or, or something like that. And I'll put a little bit of butter on it. That butter has fat. That gluten free toast has carbohydrates. And then that is a, a good thing to be able to. That's not enough food to create heat, a high heat temperature, uh, but it, it's enough to be able to stabilize your insulin levels while you sleep. All right. This question is from unknown, but it says, what are some tips to avoid for multiple wakes in the night? If I'm too hungry, I can't sleep well. If I am hungry, then I can't sleep well. I'm trying to figure out, is it if I'm hungry, if I'm not hungry, which is it? Yeah. The, the, the biggest thing is if your blood sugar level drops too low, your body is going to not get a good restful night's sleep. Or if you eat too much, what's going to happen is that you're going to create too much heat and you're not going to drop that core temperature. So in general, to go back to my last answer, uh, just be really conscious. You want to eat early. You want to give yourself at least four hours, three or four hours to digest your food before bed. Make that meal small. If you're coming to bed and you feel like you're, you're really ravenous, just have a little something before you go to bed. All right. This next question is from a guy named Peter, um, but he's from Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, nice. How do you best balance drinking water when you're always thirsty 
but you have to get up and pee? That's a really good question. I feel the same way. I feel like I'm, for whatever reason, I'm always thirsty right before bed. And then I'm like, well, I'm kind of thirsty, but I don't want to drink. And I actually literally, my husband's always like, this is insane. He's like, this is not normal. I'm not joking you when I tell you I pee the hour right before I go to bed. I pee at least five times, maybe more, sometimes even more. And I think it's subconscious that I'm like, because, you know, I want to try, I want to get a good night's sleep. So like, I just, I'm like, "Mm, let me try again. You know, like I, I go again, like going five times in one hour before bed, that's just too many times to go peep. And I somehow do it. At five times. Oh, that is so great to know your peace schedule. I mean, it really <laughs> makes me feel confident <laughs> that, uh, that you're definitely evacuating before you go to bed. So that's fantastic. Yes. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's uh, it, it, it probably one of the, the number one things that wakes people up. And then the problem is, is people have a problem going back to sleep, right? Yes. You have to go back to sleep very quickly. And there are other techniques for that. But, um, when you are going, when when you're when you're getting your hydration, it's significantly important to get your hydration all. Like I, I tell people, get a majority of your hydration done by dinner time, and get most of it done during the afternoon. So when when you like, how much water should I drink? A uh, hundred. So it should typically be. Um, um, half of your body weight in ounces and then take 80% of that. And that should be how much water you should have. So if you are a 100 pound male or female, half of that would be 50 ounces, right? And then um, and then 80% of that, which would be minus 20. So it'd be like 35 ounces of flu- uh, water a day. And then the rest could be something like that, I'm, you know. But you, it's half of your body weight in ounces of fluid, and then 80% of that should be water. And then the other can be liquid and you can get liquid through watermelon. You can get it through, you know, fruits and vegetables. You just want to make sure that you get that hydration in. So you want to have that done by dinner time. And then that's very, very common. Your body is preparing yourself for sleep to pee quite often. And I like that last pee to be right before you go to bed. Right. And it's normal to to, to pee. And then 15, 20 minutes later, let's say you're reading or something to have to go pee again because your body is, uh, you know, is trying to, I think, subconsciously get rid of get rid of the uh, the urine for you. And then, (laughs) listen, you brought this up. Once you talk about pee schedule, I can talk (laughs) about fart schedule. Right. right. So so a lot of times what ends up happening is somebody that's really gassy and you go to sleep. In your, in your, so it doesn't matter if there's urine in your bladder or there's pressure from your stomach pushing against your bladder, you're still going to feel the need or the urge to eliminate the bladder. So a lot of times people will get up and they'll be like, oh my God, I can pee, I gotta pee, I gotta pee, I gotta pee. And they'll go and it'll be like tinkle, 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 tinkle. And it's like a small little tinkle. What that actually is, is gas in your digestive tract pushing against your bladder. So, you know. Sometimes you can, you know, let a little gas out. All right, Chantel, some, you know, don't, don't be afraid of that, you know? All right? I'm a, I'm a firm believer of not sharing the same covers, not because of the gas issue that you have, but because of, you get a better night's sleep and you're not playing tug of war all night with your, your, your significant other. Okay, awesome. This next one's from Jenna in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. I wake up every night at 3 a.m. to go to the bathroom, but I go to bed at 9 p.m. Then I've already gotten six hours of sleep and then I cannot go back to sleep. Then I don't get back to sleep until five and then I have to wake up at 6.30 for work. This is my sleep pattern all the time and I have to break the cycle. How do I fix it? So I would, I would, I would coach you a few different ways. Um, what's her name? What's the person's Jenna name? From Elizabeth City, North Carolina. All right. So the, what I would do is I would first, if you if, if if you if you like, you go into bed at nine o'clock. Before you go to bed, take some magnesium. Uh, magnesium is really the safest um, thing that we use with our patients for sleep. 
it, a magnesium can help you get a little bit more of a calming, restful sleep. And it might blow you by that, that water, uh, that, 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 that pee elimination uh, issue. But what, more importantly, it will help you get back to sleep. So magnesium would be one thing. And second, I would be really conscious, like we just talked about our water intake, conscious about trying to at least have most of your water done with uh, by uh, with about three hours, you know, before three hours before you go to bed, eliminate as much as you can. Now, the second answer to the question of how do I get back to sleep once I wake up? There are so many different things that you can do. First off, if you have to wake up to pee, you want to have as little light on in the house as possible. When you go pee, go pee in a dark bathroom. Try not to turn as many lights on in a safe environment. You can use blue light, um, night lights, red light, night lights, but keep it really, really low. Chill out on the lights. And then when you go to the bathroom, when you, when you come back, lie down, try to remember the dream that you were dreaming about. Try to access and re-engage in that dream because that will um, that will est establish the same brainwave patterns and try to be able to get you back to sleep. If that feels the most difficult, most difficult technique to do is try to remove everything from your brain, your thought process. Think about thinking about nothing. Try to clear your brain, almost like look at the back of your eyelids as a, as a blank slate and then don't think about anything else. You just, you can't think. You have to remember or you have to just clear your mind. Okay. What are your recommendations for someone with moderate to severe RLS, restless leg syndrome? And this is from unknown. So restless leg syndrome, the, the most, again, the most natural um, thing that you can do for it, and then it's really, really, really effective, is effective in over 60% of our patients is to take magnesium. I like taking magnesium for restless leg syndrome. But then there are other neurology or, or um, neuropathies that are occurring because there's compression on the disc, uh, the, the body's not in the right position, um, so establishing a neutral sleeping position, which is sleeping on your back with your with your leg arms um, and legs um, straight out, that can also trigger restless leg syndrome. So I would say if you have a chiropractor or if you don't have a chiropractor, get one or bring that up to them because alignment of the spine and realigning the pelvis plays a huge role in helping getting rid of uh, restless leg syndrome. Hey guys, I want to talk to you about something that can lead to chronic disease. Yes, it's sugar. Over 70% of Americans are eating more sugar than they need to, and I was one of them. And I kept saying, you know, this is my last time. I'm going to cut back. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I didn't. I saw all the negative health effects. It was weakening my immune system, and I just couldn't say no. And that's until I discovered some really practical steps to just eliminating sugar from my life for good. And I want to teach you that as well. So everything I've learned to break my sugar addiction in my 30-day Kick Sugar Challenge. You're going to get exclusive access to a private Facebook group. You're going to have four weekly calls. You're going to get an accountability partner. I'm going to be personally walking you through these next 30 days. The most important thing you're going to learn, though, in these 30 days is the mindset you need to kick the sugar, to take your intermittent fasting to the next level. So just go to ChantelRayWay.com slash kick sugar to learn more. The best part is it's only $30 right now. That's a dollar a day investing in you for 30 days. It officially doesn't start until January 4th, but if you join now, you're gonna get pre-access to the group and we're gonna give you practical tips to not overindulge through the holidays. On December 15th, the price is gonna go up. So click the link in the description and you'll get to go to chantelrayway.com slash kick sugar and you can join the group for just $30. Okay, this next one is from Jennifer in Hartford. It says, I used to sleep great at night. I'm 47 years old and I'm going through premenopause. I know you're supposed to sleep on your back, but I just can't do it. I have to sleep on my side. Any advice? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I feel the same way, by the way, um, Jennifer, I literally, I know I'm supposed to sleep on my back and maybe like you said, that's why my score is always at restless because I'm, 
I, I feel like I start on my back and then I'm like, I just, I just can't fall asleep like this. So then I turn around to my side and I instantly fall asleep. So I am right there with her on this one. So uh, first thing with, with menopause and going through menopause, something that you can do to help with the hormones is a product called maca, M-A-C-A. It's just kind of a natural root. It's in the beet family. Um, you can play around with that. Um, you can Google and look online. You can get it online or Whole Foods and and uh, just figure out what dosage works for you. That's really good in helping regulate your hormones, especially when anybody, but also going through the change. Second, not being able to sleep on your back. Very, very, very common. The reason why it's so common is because we, a primitive ref, reflex of us, we all want to feel protected. So when we sleep on our side, we just feel like we're so protected, right? We're like hugging a little snuggie. And, uh, and this is a very protective mechanism. Think of the ostrich when they're in you know danger, they stick their head in the sand. You want to be able to make your body feel protected because when we sleep on our back, we feel so exposed and it's a very uncomfortable position. My, it, it's a primitive thing of not feeling safe. It's a primitive thing of feeling exposed. So you can use weighted blankets. You can use um, body pillows that are on top of you. You can put things like the ostrich. You can put things over your head. You can put a pillow over your head. You can put a blanket over your head, but just keep your eyes, uh, keep your nose and your mouth out so you can... Uh, so you can uh, breathe, which is a good thing. They make products like a sleep crown. You can put those over your eyes. So there are different things that you can do, but covering your head, using weight on your chest is an is a effective way to be able to feel protected when you go to sleep. And the second thing I would say to that is I'm a firm believer in the elevated sleeping position. So I like the adjustable bases. I like when you can take your bed lift up the, the back angle and lift up your legs. So almost if you can imagine sleeping at a five to eight degree angle and then uh, your legs come up a little bit so you don't slide down the bed, that is a nice way to be able to uh, sleep on your back effectively. So you really feel like you need to get one of those adjustable beds? Because I think if I had one of those adjustable beds, lifted my head up just a little bit, lifted my feet up a little bit, maybe I would be more prone to sleep on my back, right? So I, so arguably sleep is one of the most critical things that you need to, like health things that you can do to, to improve your quality of life, your vitality. I mean, it is so important to invest in your sleep sanctuary, right? In your sleep space. So yes, I firmly believe in the elevated and the adjustable bases. I believe in using like latex or, or, or a bed that bends, latex, foam, you can use either one, whatever works best for you. And then getting the bases that individually go up and down from your partner or your sleeping buddy, <laughs> or if you sleep alone, that's fine. But um, because- So you if want, someone can't afford to do that, what would they do? Then it, that, the, the next thing, then if you can't do that, they make sleep wedges. Where, where, the, where you can just actually put the wedge on the bed and it sleeps you slightly sitting up. Mm -hmm. And then you would just put a pillow underneath, like a body pillow underneath your legs to just take the angle out just a little bit. Mm. Yeah, so you were saying it's really important to, if you can afford to get that bed, make sure you don't get just one because he might want to sleep up a little higher than you or, right? Is that what you were saying? Exactly, yes. Because, you know, where let's say one night, I ate a little late because we're not all perfect, Chantal. You know what I mean? You know, sometimes we like to go out for a little Mexican food, Friday night, some margaritas. Okay, listen, I do it too. Everybody does. And then, but when I lie, when I lie flat, I get a little bit of sometimes some reflux at night if I if I if the food didn't agree with me. So you sleep, sleep, and I want to sleep up like a lot more. And then my wife only wants to sleep up a little. So I like that individual. I mean, sleep is so important. So yeah, I like the individual. If you got, if you can afford it, um, try to get the, the split, you know, split mattresses if you can. So my husband probably snores about three out of seven nights out of the week. And he sleeps on his back. Mm -hmm. But when he sleeps on his back, he snores. When he sleeps on his side, he doesn't snore. So he'll wake me up and inevitably I'll push him and roll him over and say, 
sleep on your side, please sleep on your side. And so what that's kind of like, I'm helping him not sleep as good, but if he's snoring, then I can't sleep. So what is the solution for that? Well, Chantal, if you had the solution for that, we would, we, (laughs) but here, I can give you some suggestions. Um, So if if, a lot of times, so sleeping elevated helps with snoring. Um, Losing weight, as you know, helps with snoring. Um, When you're using, if he sleeps on his back and he's using a pillow under his head, he's closing down the air canal. You need to open up the air canal. So put a pillow under his neck so the air canal stays open. Um, they use breathe right strips. You can try those. Um, they you they make these things that you can bite down on that that open up the airway. But the biggest thing that I, that I have found that helps people, believe it or not, is I teach people to suck their tongue to the roof of their mouth, or put a blanket up close or a pillow up close to it keeps the mouth shut and they breathe out of their nose because what happens is, you know the the jaw drops down and then they're they're uh, you know they're they're sawing logs or they know through their through the airway being closed down. So if they can if you they can teach themselves to become nose breathers, that's important. Uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Mercola, teaches people to put tape over their lips to keep their mouth shut so their so their jaw doesn't open. So there are different things that you can do. So if you are listening to this on the podcast, I really suggest that you actually watch this podcast on our YouTube channel. So go to our Waste Away through Intermittent Fasting YouTube channel, because I think that some of these things he's talking about, he's actually really showing them and it's really helpful. So I suggest you actually watch this episode, not just listen. But this one is from Stephanie Jacobson in Bentonville, Arkansas. I need help with night sweats. My hormones are going crazy during pregnancy. Stephanie Jacobson in Bentonville, Arkansas, which again, that's a whole other issue. Poor thing when you're pregnant. So not only is she having night sweats, but just having being, you know, who knows how pregnant she is, but imagine being seven, eight months pregnant. That adds a whole new level of issue. A whole new dynamic, you know, and then, yeah, so the issue is, is again, it's how much food are you eating late, right? Um, that will that will cause you to sweat, uh, have night sweats, um, hormonal imbalances. So again, using maca, maca is very um, if, if safe to use, especially while you're pregnant. Um, another thing is the way that you're using your covers in your room temperature. So your body really doesn't care about your hands and your feet. Right, because the, the, my hands, my hands can be sixty degrees, but your core needs to stay at ninety-eight degrees, right? Nine, ninety, actually ninety-six at night. But your core needs to be much um, warmer. So, what I teach people to do, especially if if you are, I, I don't know what climate you're in or what temperature your room is in, but just use your covers from your neck down to your waist and then have your hands, your legs or your arms and your feet exposed. And then your body will temperature regulate out your hands and your feet and then you won't sweat as much. Mm, That's great. So, you know, I remember listening to that. Some You had talked about that. Maybe it was on the Fasting Reset Summit that you were on. But I said that to someone and I suggested them and they said, no, I have to put my covers under my feet. Will, if you put your hands out, but you don't under your covers, but you don't, do you suggest that to everybody as far as the hands being out and your feet being out? Or is that just for people who are having trouble with night sweats? So that's a good point. So what, what happens is, you want to, I mean, you really got to kind of do it through like, I like the O-ring monitors your temperature. You want to see how much your temperature is dropping. Uh, but so at the beginning of the night, the, the paradox is, is that your body wants to be warm and then it wants to cool. So, so you, it wants you, you warm up. So when you first did j- jump into bed, it, nobody wants to go into bed, in bed in a cold bed, right? You want to kind of get warm. 
So you can have your arms and your feet underneath, kind of get warm, get the hands and the feet, get the blood going into the hands. So once everything is warm, then stick them out the covers. Uh, but that's typically what happens. We warm up, then we cool. And then again, your body is going to want to warm up in the, in the morning again, because the core temperature is the lowest right when you're waking up. Okay. This next one's from Cindy McAllister in Logan, Utah. I take passion flower to calm my mind at night, a day or two before my cycling starting. If I wake up in the night, I'll be awake for hours. I can rest, but won't sleep. Is this premenopause? Ooh, well, the, um, the, the, where millions and millions of people have a problem is if they wake up in the morning or they wake up in the middle of the night, they can't fall back asleep. So there's so many different things that are associated with that. It, it, I mean, to call it one, it's one of the symptoms of menopause, but it's also one of the symptoms of a type A personality. It's also one of the systems of having a, one of the things of having a lot going on. You're going to bed with something on your mind. You'll stay up when you wake up. So, so there, there are too many variables to that question to tell you it is menopause, although that is one of the factors. I would just say this. People, we as a culture need to, and I, I know that we do, but respect the time to sleep. And understand that when you wake up in the middle of the night, it is the most addictive time to think because you can both think, access your think brain and your remember brain simultaneously. So you can think about everything that you forgot for the last month because you're in both brains. And it's so addictive because you're like, oh my God, oh, I got to do this. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, I can do this. And you start thinking in this world of think zone. And then when you're in that zinc, zinc zone, it's so, think zone, it's so hard to then get to get, get back to sleep. But the thing is, is once you fall asleep, it erases it. So you're going to forget about everything anyways. So you have to be so self-disciplined in your mind to not think. You have to remember, you got to dive back into that old dream or get back into that old memory that you put yourself to sleep over and over and over again over on. So keep doing the same thing in the same way that you put yourself to sleep, get, try to be focused on getting back to that state in the middle of the night when you wake up. Hey guys, I wanted to tell you I'm offering a free weight loss virtual Bible study. Now is the perfect time to focus on understanding true hunger and fullness and learn what the Bible has to say about it. All you have to do is go to chantelrayway.com slash Bible study. After you sign up, you'll receive a six week Bible study video that you can watch on your own or you can get a small group of people and do it together. That's chantelrayway.com slash Bible study for your free six week Bible study course. Now, how important is it to increase your bright light exposure during the day to keep your circadian rhythm kind of on track? And how important is it to reduce blue light exposure in the evening? Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, you know, the, the bright light exposure is you just want to, you, you don't want to be in a dark room all day long, right? As long as you have windows in the room, um, and like this one, this, this podcast room that I'm in doesn't have windows. I wouldn't want to be in this environment. If you're going to be in this environment, get a happy light in the room, you know, something that gives you that, those good, um, those good UV rays or, or something that stimulates your, that bright light, um, that bright light stuff. If you have to, if you can take a lunch, get outside important to have sunlight. Sunlight does so many different things, not just to benefit our sleep, but more to help us stimulate vitamin D, which, which helps in your immune system and it helps in so many different things. So I believe that getting um, exposure to light is, is super important. And then the blue light exposure, where that becomes an issue is the stimulation at night. So when you have a lot of blue light, like, a, like watching TV, um, um, or, or fluorescent lights in your house and they're on, then you shut them off and try to go to sleep. You need either some blue light blockers on that you, that you wear um, on your eyes. If you're on that phone, that's blue light. So the, the blue light is very stimulating, stimulating to the brain and does interfere with your body's ability to kind of get to sleep. So I think it's definitely important to 
have your, you know, uh, we do a lot of candlelight at night, a very, very low light situations. So our, our house is very dark after a certain time. I think that's super important. Let's talk about caffeine too late in the day. I know that that is a big one for a lot of people because, you know, people don't realize that caffeine consuming caffeine can be, you could have it six hours before bed and it still is kind of still in your body. You know, caffeine can stay elevated in your body anywhere from six to eight hours. So what is kind of your cutoff that you say, Hey, you know, no, we're not having caffeine past this time or how many hours before you would say before bed. So getting to sleep and getting a restful night's sleep are two different things. So some people are like, oh, I can have caffeine at, at eight o'clock and I'll, I get right to sleep. But you're not getting a restful night's sleep. The, ha- the half-life of caffeine is five hours in most ple- people. So what does that mean? Let's say you have a hundred milligrams of caffeine at noon five hours later you still have 50 milligrams of caffeine inside of you and you need uh, uh, you know it's you need um no more than 25 milligrams in your system right to really that's you know there's no conclusive research on that but what i like that's my recommendation for people so depending on how much you have i like to have it down calculatable down to 25 or under So what does that mean? Well, if you get a Starbucks, right, that has 300 milligrams of caffeine in it, five hours later, let's say it's at noon, you're still going to have 150. And then after that, another five hours later, so 10 hours later, you could still have 75 milligrams of caffeine in your system. Mm -hmm. So I tell people before noon, don't have any caffeine after noon. And don't have any caffeine within an hour of when you wake up either, because you want your adrenal glands to turn on on their own. And you don't want to stress your adrenal glands with a stimulant. So what are the best supplements? I know we've talked about um, magnesium, but can you talk about like which type of magnesium? Because there are different kinds of magnesium that would be the best supplements if people say, look, I, you know, don't want to take Tylenol PM. You know, I don't want to take these different things. I want to go the natural route. What are the best ones? So there are a couple supplements that um, I am um, talking about, right? A couple supplements that I use. And there are ones I'm doing a little bit more research on because I've been arguably, um, I stay away from them because of the, the 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 specific effect, but there there's new ways to take them, and, and I'm working on those right now. So the two things that I use right now is I use a simple product called Calm. You can get it at Whole Foods. That's the magnesium that I use, and um, I have people take about the, you take your weight, multiply it by three. So let's say your weight is a uh, hundred pounds, so you can take three hundred milligrams of magnesium a day. And um, I like to have at least 300 within a half an hour before you go to bed. Um, So 300 milligrams of magnesium before you go to bed, that's a number one supplement I use for sleep. Number two is I use a high quality CBD oil for people. So CBD oil without the THC helps your body really, it doesn't, it helps your body get into a natural calm state, slows the brain down so you, you have a greater ability to get into deep sleep quicker. So what I find when I take CBD oil is that, uh, because I've tested everything along or against the Aurora Ring or another tracker and really saw what got me into maximizing my deep sleep and it was magnesium and calm. Um, We we have a podcast, like I told you, coming out and I'm interviewing experts that are talking about high dose melatonin resets. That I don't know as much about because in the past I've stayed away from melatonin unless you're traveling to reset when you go multiple time zones. That's the only time I use it, but um, they're making me more aware of some research. I need to go down that path a little bit more, but it's magnesium and CBD oil, the two things that we use effectively. So this is another question from unknown. It says, are naps a good thing or a bad thing for sleeping well at night? I heard as long as the nap is for 30 minutes or less, it could actually enhance your daytime brain function. Longer naps can harm health and sleep quality, but should I try to take a 30 minute or less nap every day? 
Holy mackerel! If a th- if an hour nap ruins me, I am screwed because I take I I have a, a nap built into my schedule. I don't use it all the time, but like yesterday, I took an hour nap. Um, my hour nap is a perfect nap schedule for me, and and it's all about REM sleep. Mm-hmm. It does so. There's no magic, you know, a half an hour, uh, one hour, ten minutes. Really, the thing about a nap is your body needs to make up REM sleep. When you go into a nap and your body actually goes into REM sleep, you're going to wake up drowsy and you're going to be all over the place because you're, because you're, uh, you're, 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 you're going into REM sleep in the middle of the day. So, so you wake up coming out of that. A couple hours later, you'll feel unbelievable, but you want to try to get back to your sleep schedule. So the way that I talk about napping is you need to be able to nap when your body core temperature is dropping, which is typically around noon to one o'clock. So noon to one o'clock is the best time to take a nap because it fall, your alertness follows your core temperature. So don't your fevers, but so it, that, so, so what happens is you want to be able to take a nap when your core temperature is dropping, which is about noon to one o'clock. If you have to start napping at, at three, four, five o'clock, then you're going to interfere with your sleep cycles. But if you, if you keep it to a half an hour to an hour nap, you won't, you'll be fine, especially if you need to make up that REM sleep that you lost because you had alcohol the night before, or you had too much food the night before, or you tossed and turned all night, or your cat woke you up, or your, or your baby kept you up. You want to make that up. Mm, okay. This next one is from Charmaine in South Africa. She says, so how should I optimize my bedroom environment? What is the actual best temperature I should set my thermometer to? Are you okay with me doing a noise machine? And what are the external lights or any furniture arrangement that would make it the best for me to have optimum sleep? You have great people because they ask unbelievable questions. I love that. So uh, yeah, best temperature. I mean, you know, research kind of jumps around, but everybody concludes that anywhere from 60 to 70 degrees is the best temperature. I particularly like that 65 to 67 degrees is where I keep it at because I, I use a heavy, thick down comforters from my neck to my waist. At the beginning, if it's cold and I'm chilled, I'll, I'll use the, I'll have everything under. And then when my body warms up, I'll keep, kick my feet in my hands out. And then it, it's enough to temperature, reg, it's, it's enough to be able to temperature regulate. In a cooler room, you can have less exposed. In a warm room, you need to have more exposed, like all your legs, all your arms. Hopefully that makes sense, but it's- um, So that's, so 60 to 70. So you're saying, like, what do you keep yours at, your room at? About 67. 67. So do, do you feel like if you moved it all the way to 60, you're going to get better sleep? No, like I feel like I would wake up too cold. Cold, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because and you don't want to get out. So what about the noise machine? So are you a uh, fan of the, that? The noise machine, basically, it's helping that individual tap into- her, her, the rhythmic deep, the like uh, rhythmic sleep. So it tap into her, um, her um, back part of her brain. So like counting sheep, um, you, 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 the, when you're listening to the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, you're kind of going into that subconscious brain. So I don't mind noise machines as long as it's the same noise or it's not a radio or it's something like that, that varies. So if it's something that stays consistent and you keep it on all night, that's fine. Okay, so do you think it helps though? Um, if there's noise uh, in, in that, it, like there are distracting noises in ro- the other rooms, if there's uh, like like car noises outside, yes, it does. If it's a quiet room, that's the best thing to sleep in. And then she said furniture arrangement. So is there, I guess maybe she's saying if there is like you could put your bed maybe farther away from the window, window. or I'm yeah. not sure. So, what you know, it, basically what I would go in, in the way that we set up our rooms, you never, you never have you, you know, it's like feng shui. You never <laughs> want to have your, um, your, your head against like, like a, uh, like behind you. You don't want, you don't want your head against a window. Right. 
Um, you want it against the wall. You want your feet going towards the door uh, based on energy. We have, our, I, just, I went on um, like Feng Shui, you know, Feng Shui setting up your room. And, uh, but I know the biggest thing is you don't want to have a, a window right behind your head. Mm, love it. Well, that's all the questions I have. This has been amazing. Tell listeners where they can find you, where they can follow you, and where they can get one of those amazing pillows that you have from behind you. I still have to get one. I'm going to order one today. Oh, Chantel, so we got to get you one. Absolutely. You get Absolutely. One. Just reach out to me and we'll get you one. But they can go to, we designed a specific pillow that helps keep you in that neutral sleep, sleeping position. We just got a patent last week on it. It's called Neck Nest. Dot com n-e-c-k-n-e-s-t dot com it's where your neck goes to rest every single night necknest.com so the next thing is i am starting and i'm so super excited about this a new sleep podcast this is going to be the only sleep podcast that's not going to put you to sleep right we're going to give you sleep information we're going to bring experts on we have real people making real changes where we interview people and we, we have them like, you know, sleep on their back for a month. And then we re-interview them and say, it's, 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 like, see how it works. So it's real people making real change. It's going to be cool. And it is, oh, I'm, I'm setting up the site right now to be able to be first on the list to know when the podcast launches, but it's going to be sleep tight with Dr. Sleep Right. So it's sleep tight, T-I-G-H-T with Dr. Sleep Right. And um, right spelled R I G H T. So sleep tight with Dr. Sleep Right. We're going to be launching at the beginning of uh, 2021, and I'm super excited about it. So thank you so much for helping me get that message out, Chantel. And this has been wonderful. You always bring the heat and bring great, great ideas. And we're just so grateful for you. Thank you. And if you have a question that you want answered, go to questions at chantelrayway.com. We'll see you next time. Bye bye for now. This has been a Sompronto Media Production.